The Ghost of Fossil Glen, Chapter 8. Situated, situated as it was on the ridge above Fossil Glen, the cemetery was a peaceful and scenic spot. When they were all inside the old wrought iron fence that surrounded the graveyard, Mr. Henry told the team members to decide amongst themselves how to get the work done. Allie's team stood looking at one another. Boys in one group, girls in another, announced Brad. Come on, guys, we'll start on this end. All right, said Dub agreeably. Okay, said Allie. Wait, Karen said. Pam and I decided we want to be partners, right, Pam? Right, said Pam. So what's the problem, asked Joey. You guys and Allie are one group, we're the other. Bet we get twice as much work done. He challenged with a wicked grin. The problem? Karen said slowly. I'm going to have to Shh. Quiet. Shh. Molly. Molly and Izzy. That's enough. That's enough. Izzy? No more. No. The problem, Karen said slowly, as if Joey were some kind of moron, is that Pam and I want to work alone, just the two of us. We think it'll be better that way, don't we, Pam? Pam nodded. Allie looked from Karen to Pam. Karen gazed back with a pitying smile. Pam's eyes darted everywhere except toward Allie. The week before, when the teams were first formed, the three girls had talked about what fun it would be to work together. Joey looked bewildered. Allie could feel her face turning bright red with humiliation. She looked down at the ground, wishing she could disappear. Oh, I get it, said Dub with a dangerous smile. You two don't want to give the rest of us your disease. Well, thanks a lot for sparing us. That's very thoughtful of you. They bark at everything that flies by the window. Everything. Dub Whitwell, that's not what I meant and you know it, said Karen indignantly. Dub ignored her. Fine, we'll have three groups of two instead, he said, directing his remarks to Brad and Joey. You guys be partners. Come on, Al, let us get started over at the far end. Karen smiled sweetly at Allie with her chin in the air and turned to Pam. So, did you watch Teen Twins last night, she asked. Yeah, answered Pam. Wasn't it great when the, when the geek Susan went up to Brian and said, I got your note. The look on his face was so funny. The girls' voices rose in peals of laughter as they walked away. Allie stood where she was, feeling as if she'd been punched in the stomach. Dub looked at her and shrugged. Looks like you're stuck with me, he said. Not stuck, dummy, she said, trying to smile back at him. They began walking to the far wall of the graveyard. What's up with Queen Karen and her faithful companion, whatever you say, Karen? Dub asked. I don't know, Allie answered miserably. I guess they're mad at me. How come? Allie told him what Karen had said on the phone. Oh, said Dub, frowning. She was just letting you know as a friend, eh? Well, he added cheerfully, you know what they say. With friends like those two, who needs enemies? Dub, Allie protested. We are friends. It's just a misunderstanding. I haven't had a chance to explain, that's all. Almost to herself, she added, and I even watched Teen Twins last night. Tween airheads? Dub looked at Allie unbelievingly. Tell me you don't watch that junk. Putting on a falsetto voice, he imitated one of the twins. Oh, my hair got mussed. Whatever shall I do? My life is ruined. He pretended to sob hysterically, then peeked at Allie. She couldn't help laughing. I only watched five minutes, she said. It did seem pretty stupid, but Karen and Pam like it a lot. Maybe it takes a while to get into it. Dub gave Allie a look she couldn't quite fathom. She didn't want to talk about Karen and Pam with Dub, so she went to work on the first gravestone in the row along the fence. The stone lay flat on the ground. Allie swept the leaves away and read aloud, Walter Oswald Emmons, beloved husband. Look, said Dub, here's his wife Irma, right next to him. That's nice, the way they're buried side by side, don't you think? Asked Allie as she scraped away the moss and grass that had grown over the stone. I guess so, said Dub. I mean, if you have to be here. They moved down the row, clearing off each headstone, trying their best to straighten those that had heaved in the winter frost, removing trash and forgotten offerings of dead flowers and tattered flags. Allie heard Dub hoot with laughter. Listen to this, he called. Here lies Orvin Killigrew, a wretched, poor, and lowly worm. No way, said Allie. She walked over to read the headstone herself. How would you like that on your gravestone? Dub asked. Jeez, said Allie with a giggle. Poor guy. They moved on to the next tombstone and began brushing the leaves away. It was fun working with Dub. The sun felt warm on her shoulders and she was enjoying the glimpses that the headstone carvings have offered into the lives of those long gone people. 
She walked over to a small stone that stood upright in the ground. While most of the graves sat in family groupings, this one was off by itself, spaced farther away from the others than was usual. And while many of the others were decorated with angels or flowers or comforting words, this one appeared stark and bare by comparison. Drawing closer, Allie felt a chill again, despite the sun. She read the simple inscription, Lucy Stiles, 1983 to 1994. Doing some quick subtraction in her head, she gasped, Dub, look, this girl was only 11 when she died, our age. Dub came over to see, and it was then that the significance of the name struck Allie. Lucy Styles, Dub, Styles. To emphasize her meaning, she pointed across the field to the deserted house. Hmm, said Dub, examining the carved dates. 1994, that's only four years ago. Figuring quickly, Allie said, when we were in second grade, I wonder how she died. Dub assumed the deep voice and macho stance of a TV cop. I'm afraid we suspect foul play, ma'am, he said. Allie began to laugh. She stopped abruptly at the sound of a low voice, not quite a whisper. Did you hear that, she asked Dub. What? That voice? You mean Joey? How can you miss him? It's like his mouth is hooked up to speakers. That's a great simile. But it's also like a hyperbole. It's a hyperbole. No, not Joey. It was the voice. It sounded as if somebody was right here. Dub made an exaggerated show of looking all around, over his shoulder, behind his back, behind Allie's back. Ah, yes, he agreed. I see who you mean. It's Orvin Killigrew, the poor wretched worm, standing right behind you. Dub, I'm serious. I heard the voice again. And this morning, in the classroom, I felt cold hands on my shoulders. She stopped, and her hand flew to her mouth. Right after you said something about ghosts, she looked at Dub wide-eyed. Al, he said, you're sounding kind of whacked, if you don't mind my saying so. Dub, this is so weird. You got that right, said Dub. And there's something else, said Allie. You know my journal? That book you told me about, did you use it? Yes, and remember I looked through it and told you all the pages were blank? Dub nodded. Well, last night I found writing in it. So you missed it when you looked, Dub said matter-of-factly. Allie tried to keep the impatience out of her voice as she said, I'm sure I didn't. The page was blank when I left the room. I know it was. I closed the book, went to get a pen, and when I came back, it was open to the first page, and there it was. What? Writing. Just the words, I am, and then the letter L. Capital L. Like the beginning of a name. Only it sort of broke off as if the person who wrote it had stopped suddenly. Michael, Dub suggested. Allie shook her head. He wasn't around. I looked. Besides, he can't write, especially in cursive. He's only four. There was a moment of silence during which Dub appeared to be deep in thought. So who's L? He asked. I don't know, answered Allie quietly. Have you, have you told anybody else about this, asked Dub? My parents, said Allie, and they didn't believe me. They said the writing had to have been there all along and that the rest of it was just my imagination running away with me. She sighed in exasperation. I know. I know. So I wrote about it in my journal last night. You told Mr. Henry you were hearing voices, asked Dub. I couldn't think of anything else to write about. You better hope he keeps his promise not to show anyone, said Dub, like the little men in white coats. Very funny, said Allie. Dub, you don't think I'm making this up, do you? No, said Dub, but maybe Karen can't tell when you're fooling around and when you're serious, but I can. And I'm not crazy, she declared. Dub's face gathered in a sarcastic leer, as if he was about to crack a joke. Then he must have caught the worried look on Allie's face. No way, he said. Allie felt relieved. She glanced again at the stone near their feet. L could stand for Lucy. Except for one small problem, said Dub. What? Duh, Al, she's dead, remember? Allie giggled nervously. That would be a problem. That's it for that chapter. I hope you don't mind that Izzy joined. <laughs>